To me, it's, as I mentioned, like it's just how the way how to put random things, random ideas together. And uh, to be honest, another thing really I learned is uh, I how can I say it's kind of like a, it's there is a scary side to talk about someone I care like uh, in public because Amy's my subject her response wasn't um, anything negative but the baby's father her ex boyfriend got really really mad at my, my film because uh, his notion and my like uh, my point of view totally different than I ended up writing a long apology to him. <laughs> <laughs> um, like, uh, then he even told me that uh, I cannot. Uh, he doesn't. He didn't want me to say this film documentary. Um, and then, um, yeah. Then I have to. I yeah, yeah. I just wrote a lot of apology. Hope you don't mind it, sir. <laughs> so, and did you find? Did you learn anything from uh, the making of talking about about Amy that you've taken into your work since then, as well? Um, Have you learned anything, whether in technique or approach or anything else, approach? from the making of that that you, you've worked that you've taken to your next project? Just I, I think I started trying more, using more material. Uh, last time, last my late, uh, recent project was actually a mix of um, time lapse and uh, live action. Then next one gonna be stop motion and time lapse. Uh, so I think I got more flexible after I, uh, I did this project. And Sheila, mm. um, yeah, I've gone back to the technique of ping on glass again, and it's uh, it's definitely helped me in that regard. But also, I'm I'm learning when I can become completely abstract with the imagery and not lose the audience, and that's one area I keep kind of digging into a little bit more because I like trying to go in another direction with the animation, but I don't want the audience to not pay attention to the story. So that's I think that that was kind of teaching me, you know, where I could, you know, how far I could take the animation in this more abstract direction. Did, have you found, what, what times have you found in this or other films where you went too abstract for too long for the audience? Well, hopefully um, you, you, s you figured that out in the process of making the film and, and you edit it out <laughs> before you have your finished filming. That's at least, you know, uh, the, the hope. Um, I don't know if, you know if I've lost my audience or not. I hope not. <laughs> this is an observation, and I, and I wanted to ask the filmmakers how one makes decisions about how abstract or how realistic you, you choose each, you know, for each scene um, to represent what you're, what you're going to show. Um, and I was really struck by how, how abstract Sahar's work was and, um, and yet how easily one could actually follow the story. And it seems to me that the, the voiceover track is so strong in terms of kind of anchoring uh, even the story or, or to a character that, that there seems to be the possibility anyway of a lot of freedom. But um, the, I was curious how each of you sort of thought about it. In some cases I could see there was a direct illustration or the voiceover track. And, um, but I imagine that was just a constant decision. The, the voice for me, it was the last part I did. I had no intention of having it in the film. And I went through it and made it with my own head and figured that, you know, I made each scene and I would have these background sounds and so forth. And I'd explain it to people and they're like, I don't understand what's going on at all. And then um, uh, then somebody suggested to me, like, why don't you use a child's voice like to get it to that feeling? So I was like, okay, I visited my uncle who's got little girls and I just recorded them on the spot. I wrote something really quick and just put it on top in a sense. And, and that really made the whole piece read in that way um, so that you can understand it and made each part of you know the grass and the eggs and the guy turning the papers you know more comprehensible. But again, like I was working at it from a painting, painter's perspective and it's like 
when you make a drawing and a painting, you think, oh, I'm saying it all, you know? But it's another thing when you're making like a film and to, to have a voice over it, it says a lot more than, you know, sometimes in a still drawing, you know? So. Do any of the others of you wish to answer? To, to me, um, I was, I'm not that abstract person and uh, to me, everything needs to be making sense, at least to myself. Then um, try to, I'm just, generally speaking, I'm just trying not to be too abstract. Like, uh, because uh, if, I, if I don't understand, I assume that no one understood. Then I kind of wanted to be understood. Um, then um, the element could be just a single element could be abstract, but uh, that's kind of optional. Um, so I don't know how how to explain, but uh, probably like uh, abstractness. Uh, if if like uh, three or four people, like uh, three thirty percent of people didn't understand, I think that to me is that too abstract. <laughs> <laughs> well, in in my own work. Uh, I mean, that's a, a, the question I'm always trying to figure out myself, and, and I, I, I tend to start thinking of it of the, the scene literally, but I also try to find moments when I can sort of show a metaphor of what's being said. Sometimes that will work, and and uh, and I find that when the character, after you've sort of been drawn into the story, and the character is just kind of thinking, or there's a, a you know an intense moment, then I'm free to. Sometimes the animation kind of you know you don't need to see literally what they're talking about, you can kind of express it. And that's, that's what I'm trying to do now with the film I'm doing, what I'm working on now, is that I think once I've, you've entered, you've understood, you know, where that character is and what they're talking about, and then something horrible happens, then you can just try to have this expression, expressionistic kind of animation that just sort of, you know, uh, 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 can hopefully enhance, you know, what their emotions are at that moment. So I'm always trying to think, okay, where can I take it there? And, and but the, but when I want you to follow the story literally, so you understand what they're describing, then I tend to have more literal images. Mine was sort of a non-issue. The film I did before this was very abstract, and it was it was called 420. It was about a moment in time, and so I I was excited to do something very literal. Um, but I, when I was watching the screening today, I was extremely jealous and inspired by a lot of the films. I thought your film was I love all these th films and Sheila's film I was watching, I was like, oh, I want to do that next, you know. <laughs> so, because it's very exciting with documentary, because you have this voice, and you can go on a journey with that voice. And as you saw in these, like, you know, Sheila's film, where it just disappears, it keeps disappearing, and like, the images are floating through your fingers as you're listening and on this journey. So it lets, it allows people to take the journey and end up at different places because of their own baggage and experiences, where the film I made, you don't have any choice. This is the journey you're going on. Mm -hmm. I really want you at the end of the film to feel more sympathetic and to feel a different way. So it was not abstract at all. And it was, you know, obviously, it didn't, it was more like, I won't do anything abstract. I won't even zoom out on them another foot. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, kind of on this topic, something I was thinking about, I just wanted to put out to you guys and see your response. Like so much of the dominant format of documentary animation and documentary in general is sound interview or narration. But, you know, I'm thinking like of other possibilities like maybe Baraka or Komisgatsi. Um, I was wondering if you guys have any thoughts about like other ways that, an that animation documentary could express itself that weren't like dependent on the narrative track or the sound interview. And I'm interested to hear about like your film because it sounds like it actually wasn't based on that. And also like Zahar's comment that her film wasn't initially designed to be based around, like, like wasn't designed to follow like the sound track. I think I your question is the core of the issue. I mean, that's just articulates exactly what the uh, distinction is that makes a documentary, I think. And it's like our photographs documentary, you know, if I shine a photograph like Corniscazzi of, you know, people walking down the street and then I put Mozart with it, is that no longer documentary? And it seems like this, that we use the storytelling of, well, is the voice real? Like I kept asking myself when somebody's going, well, is that really their voice? Well, that's not really documentary. 
you know, like, being like totally snobby about it, like trying to figure out, well, then what is? And it's like a really interesting question to me. I wonder, could we take, um, you know, uh, what if we took an image of me talking and then dubbed somebody else's voice in and then animated it? Where, where would the documentary, would there be no documentary left? Well, if they were if they were repeating what you had said, right? That well, that's the have. question. Well, we just saw the beloved ones, which does right. that. And right. the actors reinterpret, redoing the words of, from these testimonies that have been done. Well, uh, did that? Play? Because I I agree that this is the key issue, uh, one of the key issues, because most animated films for the standard viewer to see as a documentary needs the valorization of the radio documentary. Mm -hmm. Like the truth of it comes from it being a radio documentary, with whatever pictorial adaptation is added to it. So it's a, it's a brilliant question. It's well, how to construct an animated documentary that isn't dependent upon a radio documentary. Well, it's funny because um, the first one I ever made was based on my experiences of living with an Italian family in undergraduate school called Manja, and I never thought of that as animated documentary because I told them what to say. They were they were reenacting things that you, you know they had actually said frequently. And then uh, Michael Renoff, a professor at USC, said, oh, that's definitely documentary. There's a long history of reenactment in documentary. And it never even occurred to me that that would be documentary mm -hmm. before. So I think it's definitely open to interpretation. And we were just talking about it before the screening, too. I had been in a screening in Germany of all these animated documentaries, and there's some that I never would have considered as documentary. But And they did not use sound uh, as the documentary anchor. Um, but they were sort of, in, you know, it was much more like inspired by, you know. So it's kind of up to interpretation. I think there's debate as to what can really be considered animated documentary or not. But I personally like working with vi voice. Um, that, you know, personally that's what I'm drawn to. But that doesn't mean it's not valid not to. That's where it's interesting if you ask the two different genres. If you ask documentary, is this a documentary? You ask an animator, is this a documentary? That's where I find it most interesting. Because it's where the animators have a history of where the story is deriving from and what the content is about. And like, you know, if, if I made a film that, you know, I talked about my grandfather and dedicated it to him, would it, I could argue it was a documentary and maybe even documentarians might embrace it more as such. You know, like, it it's, depends who you're asking. Well, Helen Hill's film is exactly that. Who? Helen Hill's film, Mouse Hole, that we just saw. Oh, yes, yes, is yes. exactly that. Uh, anybody have and any that, questions about whether it, it was a documentary? I questioned it when I was watching it. But I was like, no, he's dying. Of course it's a documentary. So what elements of it were there to question? I mean, obviously, I we have his actual audio interview, or we assume it's an audio interview. Obviously, any of these films could be hoaxed, so we'll listen to that. <laughs> but um, we have, and she's doing what literal paper cutouts, obviously. So that's a different animation technique. It was a small moment, because yeah. she's interviewing the brothers, and you know, he put dimes on the train track. There was so much. Audio recordings from the funeral and service. Yeah, it was too obvious. Mm -hmm. But there were moments, which was ma what makes that film so interesting. I think. It's more of an autobiographical film than it is. Mm -hmm. Also, um, Sahar, of course, when you said your right. film was originally going to not have voice, so was it even going? Was it going to be a documentary if you hadn't added the child's voice? And even with the child's voice, no. it doesn't even change anything because it's not your uncle's voice. It's not your voice. Right. No. Even with the voiceover, I never considered it to be a documentary. I'm like, oh. <laughs> saw these things, you know, and then slowly it got to be labeled as a documentary. Documentary, and, and for me, the soul of it was that the fact that this happened to my uncle in Iraq, and that's true. The rest I can formulate in my own head and make it a story of my past experience of them, or trying to remember something and even try and recreate something to kind of. I mean, it's like I live here and I have no connection with my family overseas. And it's like if I see my cousin dad, I don't even know who they are in the street. So it's kind of me trying to make that sort of connection over there a bit through the piece in some way. And I mean, it's like I, I didn't cry, you know, like if, if my parents were to be shot here and I, I was, oh my God, you know, but um, there's that disconnect. And, kind of trying to deal with it and just be like, okay, I'm going to make a piece in that way that shows, you know, it, his situation, but just the general situation of the whole thing and, like, my distance in a way, too, of the whole war. So it's, like, about him and just the whole politics of it, I guess, and the time period here what's going on currently. So I wanted to tie both of them in. 
You're very good. Tell us about the how you, your narration then developed, and how did you decide on that as your vocal track and so forth? Um, the narration, please. Mm -hmm. um, first, it wasn't uh, my the narration wasn't my voice, but but more I just. More, well, I just thought it's. I thought this should be my voice because it, this is just one. Could be just one aspect about someone. Then I decided my. It, it's my myself. Then. Um, then when I talk to. Uh, by the way, this is my thesis frame. Then, when I talk about. Then actually, I tried to do voiceover my, by myself, but. Um, um, the professor just recommended to uh, find someone else with like like that to find that thing. Yeah, then, yeah, because I agree because I wanted to be understood. <laughs> <laughs> you understand. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, this, uh, this question can be answered by anyone, but um, just generally about the interviewing process and what it's like just interviewing them and getting to know them before you start asking all the questions. This was for Liz, like. Um, Okay, and they're talking about something that's really personal. So, had you, what was your process of getting to know them, then warming up to you, and also then with Safari, you're talking about your film. Now you're working with kids, you're interviewing kids. So, what's what's that like? My, um, in my film, I was more interested in my relationship building with the subjects than I was with the technique of animation. And um, I started sending out a bunch of emails looking for sexy seniors in the LA area, <laughs> and then found a, a, a composer, and his um, and I went to meet him, and uh, I brought him pastries, and I went to visit him like five times, and then I started cooking for him, and then as we got to know each other, he just pulled out his phone book and said, you have to meet all my friends. And all of these people in this film lived in Leisure World and Laguna, and they were all part of a humanist uh, religious group, a Jewish humanist group, and they all are part of a Walt Whitman circle. So they read le Leaves of Grass, Blades of Grass, Blades of Grass, once a year, every year, and they've done that for 20 years together. So they were all artists in one s sort or another. And it was a lot of pastries and a lot of mm -hmm. coffee and a lot of soup. Mm -hmm. And it took months, you know. I, and from the first time I met them, I said, I want to make this film because my grandfather fell in love at 84 and he grew hair off of a bald head because mm -hmm. he was... And, sex. <laughs> and he was reborn because of this puppy love. And so they were all clear about what I was looking for. And I just never, I never wanted to ever feel like I was taking something that was not being given. And um, it was a very long process of trust. And I have a lot of footage that, that they've, you know, I have releases on all of it. You know, I've got stories about the Holocaust. I've got stories, I've got a lot of unbelievable footage that at some point I would like to revisit. But I don't think that you get a um, really intimate interview if you're not somewhat intimate with your subjects. Um, with the film I'm working on right now, it's complete opposite. Like I went to Jordan to Middle East for like a month and I really wanted to film my family who were Iraqi refugees, but they refused because of security reasons. So they're like, you want a family, we'll try and find your family. And then they're like, well, there's this woman who lives in a house with no walls, with five kids, and she's 28, and her oldest daughter is like 13. I'm like, okay, great. Like, can we go visit her? They're like, well, we'll see. Like, you know, I wait a couple of days, and then um, they finally take me there. And um, it's, it's a really tough situation. They're like, okay, we're going to leave you here for three hours, and then we'll come pick you up. And, and, the, and I didn't have 20 tapes, you know, I just had like two tapes total or like a tape and a half of footage when I spent time with this mother. And I, I was honest with her about my views about America and like I grew up here, I didn't grow up in Iraq. And, but her children were very excited for me to come into her space because nobody ever visits them. And she was okay with me filming her children and her children were just up front with me and honest and they really wanted to draw on color like I, I just gave them that attention and care and you know to really understand their situation because people will just come by and give them bread and food nobody spends time with them and I actually went into the space and spent time with this family and they really appreciated that in return she made me dinner she cooked food for me you know 
and it's like I came back and you know I only had a tape and a half worth of footage and, and that's where I'm um, like animation could come in to replace all these things that I didn't shoot you know I, it, and um, so like sure I have close-up shots of them but there's only so much you can capture with tape and you're like the rest of it I can create their whole world with their imagination and the children and what they think through, through them expressing through the drawings with that and tie it with their real footage so I can give it that dynamic look because otherwise if you look at the footage you like there isn't really that much there and it's like you have to make up the rest of it but the key points of their voices where they say you know this is like a dead girl this is like a dead body she got ran over by a tank you know like a five-year-old saying that that's all you need and then my head just goes like crazy okay I know what I want to make um, sure, Imran, Imran's heard me talk about this already, <laughs> but but um, but I agree with with what uh, both the other filmmakers were saying that if you're intimate with your subject, that that's the the quality of the interview that you'll get in return. I think that if, if you're very formal, that they'll respond in you know in the same way. So I think that if you can, you know, let your guard uh, let their guard down, and that a lot of that um, the richness in their voice will come through. I really think the voice is so powerful. And and the more people can really just confide in you with the when you're recording them, the better quality of, of sound you'll get. Did you videotape your interview with her? Me? Or is it audio? No, like? not that one. That was all audio. Some of them I I've, I've taped. There's one film I did where I had rotoscoping, but um, but uh, generally I stay away from that now. I, I take some photographs, so I have some references, but uh, but I haven't been shooting the interviews. Because audio interviewing is always less intimidating. Subject. That's oh, true. So That's hard. very true. You, are I you agree. both videos interviews as well? That's right. Or did you do audio interview as well? I did all video for, yeah. for this one, but then I had like a hand on audio. I did video and I didn't film it. I, I had a friend come <clears throat> so that I could stand nowhere near the camera. Mm -hmm. And I wanted the video because you now the most important animation to me was their eye movement. And that's what I studied was the connection between what they were saying and where their eyes move and just trying to get really inside of this little finite stuff. Yeah. And that was in the reference. That's good. That's, good that's sort of the, where your observation most is acute. Did it go? Yeah. Uh, mine was female interviews. <laughs> <laughs> that's probably on your mind. But of course, yours can live then. I mean, one thing which animation can do is create a document of an interior life, of an interior mindset, which obviously live-action documentary footage can't do. Uh, so if you have a film, like your film of Amy, of course, is actually looking in your head. Really, mm -hmm. I think it's well. uh, Any other final questions, please? From all of you. We've been here for quite a while. Any other comments from all of you? All right, thank well, you. we'll thank go out to the thank courtyard you. for one-on-one -on -one and drinks after that. Mm -hmm. But thank you all for coming. We hope to see you on Monday at 13.